Welcome to What is Going Om for new thought from the edge of Om. Each week on Om Times flagship radio show, veteran broadcaster, author, and media consultant Sandy Sedgbeer conducts thought provoking interviews with inspirational authors, artists, musicians, scientists, speakers, and filmmakers who are working at the point where spirituality and science meet consciousness at the very edge of Om. Here is your host, Sandy Sedgbeer. Hello. In this time of global turbulence and uncertainty, when nothing seems to make sense anymore and nothing is behaving as we thought it would or should, the questions I'm hearing most often are, how do we find inner peace, harmony and stability in a world that is becoming increasingly unstable? And what can we do to turn things around and create the new world that we all think is possible? Over many years of hosting shows like this, I've investigated and shared many books, courses, programs and tools designed to help us thrive as we navigate the shifting tides of change. But today, we're going to hear about an exciting new approach called the Dream Arc, which has been created in collaboration with over 120 contributors storytellers, artists, musicians, and wisdom keepers from various traditions across the globe. Here to share why it's being described as the ultimate antidote for our troubled times, our international teacher, mystic, poet, and founder of the Gene Keys, Richard Rudd, and inspirational artist, teacher, author, and creator of the Wisdom Keepers Oracle, Rosie Aronson. Richard, Rosie, welcome. Thanks, Sanji. It's, it's lovely to be here. Good to have you both. Um, let me start with you, Richard. Um, to call the Dream Art a program or a course doesn't feel right. To me, having dived into it, um, it is so vast, such a massive project. I don't know how you pulled it all together in three years, um, but it is much more of an intensive inner journey, um, really an adventure of discovery that takes us uh, to a new level of consciousness within ourselves. So. Um, you know, what I want to know first of all, how did this massive, massive project first get birthed? Oh wow! Well, as as you know, Sandy, I'm you know I'm I'm kind of most known for for my work on the Gene Keys, and um, and the and the Gene Keys are are this kind of code and way of understanding ourselves and the world around us and our relationships and um and all of that, and. Uh, at a certain point, I, you know, I wanted to create something um, different, something from the other side of the brain, something that had to do with more of the right brain journey. And, um, and I, and I had a sort of little mini vision. I had a kind of visitation from a, from a, from a wild bird in one of my dreams and uh, called a bee eater. And, and, it, and I, it was very odd that I had that dream and it, and it was one of those dreams that just woke me up and it was sort of, you know, in the right in the middle of the night and I was like what is that what was that and what was that bird and so I looked it up I'm a bit of a birder and um and I thought about it and I and I kind of had this series of revelations that I was going to create something to do with nature animals and birds you know the creatures of the underworld and all of it and so and and as I was thinking of that um of like translating my work with the gene keys with the same code into like creatures and animals, I just thought of Rosie, who's this amazing woman and friend, deep, dear friend of mine, and just has such a genius. I mean, she's, you know, sorry, Rosie, I know, don't want to embarrass you, but you are a genius. I've worked with you now for three years and everyone who's worked with you kind of knows that this is true because you, you have such a wide set of gifts and skills. Um, and so, but I didn't, so I asked Rosie whether she would, do this with me and she said yes after thinking about it and and then we set off on this journey but we had no idea that the journey was going to end up being so huge um because it just grew as creative journeys often do and it became this odyssey um so that's kind of where it started um and it and it because i just thought it would be like we'd create this beautiful online course or something and and actually we ended up stretching the internet about as far as you can stretch it in terms of consciousness like to help us evolve a consciousness 
and um, and and just put, bringing in all these different people, the contributors, as you mentioned, the artists and stuff, and it, it just made a. Uh, you know, this this program, this odyssey, this journey was created by a village. You know, it was created by people from all over the world, you know. Um, and so, yeah, it turned into something completely magical. Well, the whole, the whole project is about unity. So, of course, in a way, when you look back on it, of course it would embrace many, many, many people. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. Rosie, you were kind of mostly responsible for that. In that the beginning of that impulse so maybe you say something about how that came about for you sure um well first of all i'm just so grateful and honored to be here so thank you sandy for inviting us and thank you for like diving in and experiencing it yourself and getting a visceral understanding that this is hard to put into words what this mm. dream rock journey is that's much bigger than what our verbal capacities can do um, I do want to acknowledge and honor that before I was even invited into this project, Richard had already written the Dream Arc Animal Codex, where he described uh, in deeply poetic, wise, beautiful uh, words, the meaning, the underlying meaning and the multicultural symbology and mythology of 192 animals. And this is kind of like the, it's, uh, what would you say? It's like the library, the living library that's at the, at the base of the entire dream art journey. So when Richard invited me into this, it was more about how are we gonna take this incredible wisdom and writing and download that Richard has received and share it with the world and include the world in that sharing process. And I, I guess I wanna say that, you know, the, the dream art, we have four, main pillars that in, that are about the dream arc approach right so there's like there's discovery playfulness generosity and trust and i would say that the the reason why this whole thing happened was because richard trusted his intuition and asked me to to enter the unknown together with him and collaborate on this and i trusted my intuition enough to say yes even though it, it was a little bit intimidating and scary, and I have no idea why he's calling me a genius. I'm certainly not a, a special human in any capacity. And honestly, I have public speaking fears. So even right now, I'm using the dream arc to support me and taking the leap and having this conversation with the two of you online. And this is kind of what, like the biggest gift, I think, is what I think about the dream arc. It's like, okay, it's this quest that we're all invited to go on where our lives are the landscapes. And by lives, I mean both the inner life that we have, whether it's our dreams or our emotional life or our spiritual lives, and then the everyday life that we walk, each of us. And the idea is to invite each person to truly honor our unique way of engaging in that life. You know, because I'm not Richard Rudd, I could never be Richard Rudd, but I can be Rosie. And you can be Sandy. And if all of us are given the conditions through which we can kind of discover who we are, like have ourselves. All of who we are. Life, yeah. All of who we are. And then yeah. all of who we all are yeah. together, then maybe we can make our collective dreams for this crazy world come true. So, it, you know, it reminds me of um, an exquisite game in some respects. You know, you can dive into this game as many of the kids do today with the, the games that they're playing on their Xboxes. And you could spend a long time just, you know, and like a choose your own adventure book where you are literally following your intuition and going down paths that your intuition is leading you down that are then taking you deeper and deeper. But, but let's just backtrack a bit because we've got animals and we've got obviously you know all the shamanic wisdom here and we've got dreams and your work is not dream work as we traditionally know dream work same with the animal work where you know you look in a book and you oh this animal means this and this dream means that this is quite different so tell us a little bit about what it entails and why yeah well that when we talk about dreams, you know, we're we're kind of referring in the dream arc when we even the name dream arc is referring to what the indigenous peoples or what has been interpreted as through you might say the word dream time, 
you know, and or we might also call that the quantum realm, you know, the quantum world, you know, the place where we're all linked and connected and entangled together and unified. And in that field, like it's the field that we do enter into um, as we go into deep sleep or into full awakening, even uh, where we where we we kind of remember the depth of our true soul uh, in, in self-realized moments. And so the dream arc is a journey that is like it's its purpose really is to widen the pathway between all the dimensions that exist inside us. Right. So when you journey into sleep or out of sleep. Um, and you go into dreamless sleep and then you come through dreams and then you come into waking reality and then you move around the world and you have naps and daydreams and imaginations and arguments and all the things that happen. And then at night again, you start to close down again and, and you go back into that other world. All of that is is kind of one field of consciousness, you know, and so the dream arc is about widening the awareness so that it can travel so that our awareness can go deeper and deeper into our unconscious and up into our superconscious which is the part of us that is universal or even eternal or so that so that's the quantum realm or the dream time the dream time doesn't end when you wake up you know it, it's it's an unbroken field of awareness and the more we can generate our awareness to move seamlessly through all those realms in a way, we never then go to sleep. You know, even though our body falls asleep, there's a part of us that never sleeps and it, because we're eternal, right? And, and also it's training for death because when we go to sleep, it's like when we die and when we're born. You know, we come in, we go out, we fall asleep, we wake up. And so in a way, it's, it's that deep, the dream market. It's really training us to stay awake at some deep level, you know, at, you know, right in the depths of our psyche, so that even as we approach our death, that 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 light remains consistent. You know, so we don't fear death either. You know, because we we've realised that eternal nature that it's a it's like a channel that goes right through the heart of our being, right through the heart of every being, every being. That's why the animals are included, because they're all little aspects of the programming of the dream time. And they all represent aspects of our psyche, of our being. And so they're codes that come to us, like at the moment in my study here, um, a nest of bees have arrived. They've never done that until this year. You know? and, they've, and they've set up their beehive up in the eaves of my wooden oak thing here. And so all day long when I'm up here, I have this hum you know, and it's just it's just this beautiful hum, and I have this lovely smell as well of like what of the honey I guess they're making in there, or you know, and it's you know, these are little kind of miracles or or connectors that take place as we open that awareness inside us. We open up to nature, to these other realms, even to realms of of really high what we call heightened levels of consciousness um, and memory. You know, so. That's really the, I remember saying to Rosie at the beginning of this journey, I said, you know, what we're creating here is actually a spiritual path that take that can take you the entire way. <laughs> it's not just like, you know, stopping short of, you know, and then you have to go and see this Indian master to get the rest of the way. It's actually the whole way. Um, and so it is in its own right, a, a kind of really wild, valid path of awakening. Um, I guess that's, you know, some, some of my riffs that are... What I notice about it and what I love about it is that um, unlike many, you know, things that we may do to expand our consciousness, um, this is an inner job. It's all an inner job. You know, everything that I'm going to do on this course or this approach, with this approach, this journey, it's all about going within me to find my truth, my ancestral gifts, my whatever is within me, as opposed to, you know, reading a book or hearing that I do this exercise and this may happen and that may happen. This is a kind of like a self-directed journey with you guiding along the way. Mm. And I think that's where this pandemic and what we're going through right now there's, that's the gift in it, is that it's everybody is having to find their inner self and what they need 
to move through this. And it's interesting it took you three years, you know, because we've, we're coming out of really what is a th near enough a three-year process. And we need something like this at this point in time to take us on, you know, forward so that we can make this transition and grow through it. So tell me about your role in this, Rosie, um, because you're the dream guide. What does that mean? What does that entail? Oh, my gosh. Okay. Well, um, and I I'm, I'm just want to say I'm very inspired by what Richard said and what you said right there, too. So I could also just, like, speak to that as well. But I'll talk about my own guide, guide self. So basically, we have four people who are really like the, the core of the creative team. And then we have all these people who have completely participated. We call Richard the sage for obvious reasons. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and so I am the guide. Rosie is the guide, right? So my job is to take some of these incredible, beautiful concepts and way of understanding the inner and outer world and the spiritual realms and how life works and all of the archetypes that just so beautifully and poetically flow through Richard and bring them down to earth and help people experience them in, in, in their lives through inviting experiential opportunities, right? So that while people are kind of moving through it, they're getting all these invitations to actually learn how to tap into themselves and to get their answers and to make use of the clues, the beehives, uh, the, all the things that are popping up in our lives all the time and in our dreams, right? So it's almost like a little bit like what Richard was saying, you know, one way to work with dreams is to think of every aspect of the dream as a part of oneself. And in a way, that's the same thing happening in our waking lives. Every time we encounter another being, an animal, a plant, a tree, a body of water, uh, we are encountering a part of ourselves. So the dream arc really helps people decode, decode those relationships and those beings that actually exist inside of us and are here to guide us along the way. So uh, one thing I do is I respond to, to Richard's sage-like sharings, and I try to do my best to share how it applies to a person's life and how it might be applying to what's happening in the world in general, through something called Rosie's Riffs. Um, I'm the one who's brought in a lot of the collaborators, the artists, the musicians, the poets, the, the healers, many of the indigenous wisdom keepers, trying to populate the dream arc with other voices. Because for me and for Richard, the dream arc is a collective phenomenon. It's a movement. It's a journey that many people are going to be going together and we're going to need to be using those inner listening antennas to be able to draw meaning and uh, inspiration from so many of our fellow travelers, our fellow journeyers in life. Um, what else do I do, Richard? I, I did the artwork. Uh, I project managed the whole thing. Um, and really my, you know, he brings in the vision and my job is to help people I guess maybe to hold the vision for the journeyers moving through the process and to be guiding them through it. That's Let me give an a couple of examples, yeah. Rosie. Yeah, of I was like, just going to ask about that. Yeah. Of like dive-in invitations? Yeah, yeah. Dive okay, because every time you move through a different module, you go through three steps. There's the explore the habitat where Richard and I kind of share about the particular category. We can talk about that later, whether it's the leapers or the unifiers or the messengers or the healers. Um, and then people are invited to find their animal in their own way. And sometimes you listen to the sound of an animal and the one that attracts you or maybe repels you is the one that you click on. And that becomes your animal for that category to really focus on. And then you go to the next, the next part of the journey inside of each module. And that's called the dive in section. And that's where we give people opportunities to have real life experiences. And basically it's Richard will talk about this too, but this is very right brained. It's very symbolic. It's not like you read something and say, oh yeah, I want that invitation. You see a symbol and then you click on the symbol that speaks to you for some reason. And then something will open up for you. And it might be a written invitation or it might be a video where I'm asking you to have an experience. And it might be to work creatively with something, to create a Mandela or to walk a labyrinth or to make a meal 
for, to invite people into your home and experience a unifying experience through sharing food together, which is one of the main ways that wisdom has been passed down through generations. It might be go to a body of water, get up really early and watch the sunrise. Um, it might be explore your relationships in your life by thinking of each person in your life as an animal. And if you look at it through that prism, how might that change the way you perceive the way that everybody is interacting with, with each other and how you might actually encourage greater healing or harmony or mutual understanding between the people inside of the family? I mean, there are over 70 invitations, so I can go on and on. I don't know if there are any that you want to share. There's also the, also the sloth that you were talking about as well. Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess tell, what tell I'd me say... About this. The sloth, because that that's a really good little example yeah, there of what sure. someone I might mean, experience. You know, so it's very playful and colourful with the dream arc. So when you're actually, you know, travelling through it, it's it's very. It is like you said, Sandy. It's like a game. It's kind of it, it's it's surprising all the time. And so what Rosie was saying is like the main thing about those invitations is that's important to know is that the invitation that you pick is the perfect invitation for you. Um, and you might ha you might feel like, oh, why did I get that? You know, <laughs> and that's exactly the right feeling that the dream arc should bring in a way, because, so well, sometimes it will give you a delightful invitation that you'll be like, yeah. And other times it'll be like, oh, that's going to be a bit of a stretch for me. And that's what the dream arc does. It constantly surprises us because we're trusting our intuition. The dream arc, it didn't choose that you chose it out of hundreds you know out of lots of options you got you navigated there following symbols following trusting your intuition and that's what the course really does you know this this program this odyssey it's like it trains us to absolutely trust in our intuition and in a way that's a bit of a trick because the deeper we trust in our intuition just by doing this process the more that leaks into our everyday life you know, because then we start to, you know, it's in like an entrainment. It's quite subtle. Yeah. It's a little bit tricky like that, the dream arc. It tricks you in a way, but it tricks you to trust your right brain much more. So anyway, I've gone off at a slight tangent and I will, do, but I just want to say that, as Rosie said, it is a right, we live in a left brain world. You know, we really do. This is why so many people are suffering from anxiety because of the structures we've created and, you know, the sort of the time constraints that we put on ourselves and that you know it's it's all numbered everything we do our bank account our, everything is numbers and th you know and line linear things like everything is straight lines in our lives and our soul lo longs for the circular you know it longs for the arc the dream arc it longs for things that aren't consistent that are mysterious that don't make sense that are that make us just laugh or just touch our soul. That's what the, that's what our soul is really looking for. And, and in our world, we need that balance. There's not a single person, I guarantee, listening or watching this right now, yeah. who doesn't need more right brain um, balance in their lives to bring them back into their creative, you know, spirit, and begin to let go of all that. You know, all those pressures of like, oh, I've got to make this money. I've got to get to this place. I've got to be this person. I've got to. You know, it's, uh, it's exhausting, all of yeah. that. And the yeah. right brain is completely the opposite. It's, it drops us into this, this deep, as you said, Sandy, deep ancestral wisdom that is inside us, a well of, of the feminine inside us. It's a deep feminine process, this. So tell me how the so sloth would help the sloth. <laughs> access that. <laughs> yeah. So the sloth is a, is a perfect example. So throughout the course, it's one of the one of the many fun things that every now and again, as you're navigating, there's a little thing that pops up and says, hi, I'm the sloth. Would you like to slow down? You know, and, you know, and it's, it's sort of saying you need to slow down in a way. But, in a, you know, so and so you kind of you click it and then what will happen is you'll be given a, a resource or something that will inspire you or help you or teach you to slow down inside yourself it might make you think very deeply about the way you live your life and how often do you slow down how often you know do you slow down before you eat something do you consider before you shop do you you know it's like there are so many areas we we don't contemplate and this is a contemplative course you know it's a deep part of one of my teachings the art of contemplation like so the sloth 
is filled with amazing resources from like something very short, like there's a beautiful, that they've all got really beautiful names. Like there's a very short little one I, that I love called 38 seconds. They've all got kind of these funky names and it, and in it, you just click on it and it's a piece of music. I think it's flute music or it might be violin. I can't remember. I think it's flute music by one of our contributors and it's only 38 seconds long, which you'd say is nothing, but actually the discipline is to hold those 38 seconds with a sort of laser awareness you know, so that you're really listening to nothing but that flute for those 38 seconds. And you're, you know, so you put your headphones on, you just go into space, you lie down and you, and you just give yourself such a short space of time. But if you do it really well, you will drop so deeply into the core of who you are and you'll realize, my God, I could do this any time. And then you might do another 38 seconds and you might do, you're invited to do as many as you like, but that's, that's a very short one. There are other ones like, um, for example, one of my favorites is it clipped, it kind of connects you through to Norwegian slow TV. Um, and like Norwegian slow TV is like, there's a, there's a live train traveling through Norway with a camera on the front and it's live and you can just sit and loads of people, uh, and it's very popular in Norway and in, in the Scandinavian <laughs> countries. You just switch it on and you can see where the train is and people will watch it for hours because it's just live. It's like somewhere in a remote part of the Norway, that train is actually there. And that reindeer that's crossing the line is actually a real thing happening. And it just sort of there's not there's no reason for it. There's no ulter, ulterior motive, you know, other than oh, it's just a break from the linear. You know, yeah. it's yeah. just yeah. that's the right brain. It's like just drop into this space. And so the, the sloth is filled with those kind of invitations and little meditations and experiences and colorful things. You know, it's, it's, it's wonderful. You can ne almost never exhaust them because they keep coming up. And, you know, anyway, so, so I sounds, love the sloth. Sounds to me as though it's many, many experiences, chances, opportunities for us to experience ourself and our responses and whatever, you know, responses we get from what we're doing watching listening to in a way that we might not normally yes yeah can yeah. can i can i share something to that point sure um, also because what richard is saying is in a way we're, we're creating this huge world within worlds where we can train ourselves to be awake present alive playful uh in touch with the oracular nature of life you know, every every moment, every encounter that we have in a way is an oracle presenting a teaching to us, an opportunity to us, a, um, a chance to see things in a different way. And so, for example, we have this sloth, which operates as an oracle. You click on it. You don't know what you're going to get. You get this opportunity and then you take it in. You allow it to transform you. And over time, as you have more and more of these kinds of experiences, then, for example, something like this happens. I'm invited to talk to the two of you on this in this conversation. And we're told that we have a three minute, there's like a three minute countdown before we are before the cameras go on. And during that three minute countdown, there's this beautiful music that we get to listen to while we're muted. And it feels like a sloth experience for me. Like my real life is giving me an opportunity to slow down in a context where I might normally be nervous. <laughs> and um, and so the dream arc lives inside of the actual dream arc landscape we've created, but then it spills out into our life. And we start to have these experiences all the time. So I want to acknowledge you for the sloth moment you offered me today. <laughs> and then one more thing I wanted to say about um, this right brain thing. I, I feel like never before has our capacity to stay in the right brain meet been more needed than now. Yeah. Because all of the structures that we have been counting on, the systems, all of the tracks that we've been told, you follow this track, you're going to get to the truth. You follow this track, you're going to get to the right life, the right education, the right job. It's all disintegrating in front of our eyes. And yeah. we are being all being asked to learn how to navigate in this new, quite chaotic, confusing landscape. What is the truth? We can't figure it out in our heads anymore, okay. right? We have to learn how to rely on something else. And like you keep saying, Sandy, something deep within us. Yeah. And as we do that, we start to find our collaborators. 
we start to, we get into our own flow and then we start to flow together. And the way in which the new world will be built will be through a collective flowing process. Yeah. So I just wanted to add that to the conversation. Thank you. We were going to play a little clip before the break, but what we're going to do is play it when we come back from the break. Um, so uh, we're going to go to break now. And when we come back, you can tell us a little bit about the clip you're showing and the context of it. And it obviously is representative of many of the video clips that you have available as part of the um, uh, Dream Arc. You're listening to What Is Going On. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and I'm speaking with international teacher, mystic, award-winning poet, and founder of the Gene Keys, Richard Rudd, and inspirational artist, teacher, author, and creator of the Wisdom Keepers Oracle, Rosie Aronson, about Dream Arc, their extraordinary new body of work. We'll be back with more after the break. Ohm Times TV. Imagine becoming a super influencer. Reinvent yourself, invest in your brand, and then manifest your success with a robust, spheric approach. Ohm Times Media and Broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer you deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. Through our produced shows, Own Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an Own Times magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on Ohm Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive Ohm Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. Ohm Times, open yourself to the possibilities. If I could be you, you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's minds Walk a mile in my shoes Walk, Walk a mile, mile in my, my shoes Well, before you abuse, criticize and accuse Walk, Walk a mile in my shoes Welcome back. Well, we... Um, we're going to have a look at a little clip now that Rosie's going to tell us about. It is an example of, wow, you've got many, many hours of different videos that people can watch over a prolonged period of time. They don't have to do this all at once um, because the journey itself can take as long as you like, can't it? It certainly can, and it will. I'm, I'm in it myself, and I can feel this is going to take me quite some time. And Richard himself has said that it's going to be at least a year. And for me, it's, it's a living experience that I will continue to return to over and over again. But to answer your question, uh, yeah. one of the things that we did that we thought was, we were just so excited by this idea, uh, was we invited people to tell their animal stories. Because everybody you know, no matter how intellectual or impressive they are, you know, everybody relates to animals at a very deep, visceral level. Animals, uh, they make us, uh, they open our hearts, they make us scared. We have, we have dreams about them. We have encounters with them. We get annoyed with them. You know, like every human being, and we are also them, we are animals, we all can relate to animals. And so we thought this would be a really fun way to help um, ignite the, the, the spirit of the dream mark was asking people to share their animal stories with us. So we have people sharing stories just in two, two minute to five minute videos that we kind of edited together for most of them. Uh, and it could be like a, a cat that someone had when they were, you know, a child that helped them learn how to love. It could be very, very simple, or it could be something more uh, extravagant, like this particular one we're going to be sharing with you. This is a woman named Louisa McCoon. She is an animal rights activist. She is very into contemporary arts. She's a philanthropist, and she tells a story, a very beautiful moving story about an orca. And I won't say more than that, but know that this is just one of many, many dream tales, we call them, T-A-I-L-S, that have been contributed to the dream arc. And one of the big invitations is for everyone to think about if they were to tell an animal story, what would that be? Uh, 
So okay. they give Let's you have a look at that clip now. Yeah. Then. I am an animal advocate. Uh, in fact, an important part of my work is to advocate for all animals and to basically illustrate that healthy societies are humane and compassionate. I frequently say that where animals fare well, so do the people. And likewise, where animals are not doing well, neither are the people. So generally speaking, if it has four legs, wings, or gills, I'm working on improving the lives of these animals. And probably sow pigs and egg-laying hens are the ones that have most of my attention right now. But during the pandemic, another species caught my attention. There's a killer whale, also known as an orca or a dolphin, off the coast of the Seattle area in the Salish Sea. Residing with her protected pod, a group of about 70 orcas known as J-Pod. This particular whale had given birth in 2018 to a stillborn calf. And in her grief, this mother whale carried the calf's body on her rostrum, also what we might think of as a nose, for 17 days before finally letting it drop to the sea floor. Because this pod was so well documented and studied, the biologists were able to observe what came to be known as her tour of grief. It made the newspapers and TV uh, TV news around the world. What I didn't know at the time was the name of the whale. So let's flash forward about uh, two years. Very happily, she became pregnant again in 2020, and news of her pregnancy made uh, papers, magazines, and, and TV news stations around the world. When I read about her pregnancy, I discovered her name, which is Tahlequah. Now, where I come from, Tahlequah is the name of one of our special and wonderful little towns. It's home to the Cherokee Nation, Band of American Indians. It's the heartbeat of the Illinois River. It's where my great-grandfather was the town doctor for generations. It's where my grandparents are buried and where my father was born. I looked it up, and it's also 2,060 miles away from the Salish Sea and totally landlocked. When I learned that our mother killer whale orca was named Tahlequah, I was so, so, so excited. I knew not only was there a connection to my state, but also that there was an opportunity to create a connection between me marine life of a landlocked river and a sea that opens onto the Pacific Ocean, which we did. We formed the Oklahoma Killer Whale Project. We set up travel exchanges between Oklahoma and Seattle. We went there, and Casey McLean, the veterinary nurse who founded a hospital to help marine mammals, she came to Oklahoma. It was awesome, and I learned so much about this beautiful species that, as Casey says, does family really well. They are incredibly harmonious and loving creatures, much like elephants, we could say. Tahlequah gave birth to a healthy male calf in September of 2020, and the biologists have named him Phoenix, and he seems to be thriving with his pod and his mother. I think that the message I got from Tahlequah was about hope after grief. Also, my mother, my own mother, lost her sister in childhood shortly after World War II. That was a grief she carried with her really uh, for the rest of her life. I think while grief can be paralyzing at times and maybe even seem never to fully go away, that there is always a new door opening. Miracles do occur and love does come again. So here's to Tahlequah and all she can teach us about patience, gentleness, empathy and devotion, compassion, and thinking about her in the ocean, even boundlessness. That's a very sweet clip. Um, very interesting when you start thinking about uh, all of the synchronicities. Uh, and you have to be aware to notice them, don't you? So what you're saying, I think, is that with the dream work, with the animals, we learn to become more aware of what is happening around us and to take note and to see this, you know, to see the messages in the symbology. Yeah, I think, you know, I love that you chose that clip, actually. Um, and it sort of brings a lump to your throat, or mine anyway, um, because it's 
you know, it's where our contemplation or our, you know, our noticing of something um, becomes action. Like Louise acted on her impulse. She acted on her right brain. It was completely illogical. Why the heck would you connect Oklahoma with the Pacific Ocean and start a, a, an orca society in Oklahoma? It's completely left right brain, you know? And that's what the right brain does. That's how it operates. It makes leaps in consciousness that make no sense but lead to all kinds of amazing teachings and opportunities and above all meeting people i mean louise is one of the people that we met through doing the dream arc i mean we've met so many amazing people that we didn't know her before it's like she just came in and as as did many others and so a huge part of the dream arc is about reaching out and meeting and connecting with other not just with people but with with the creatures around us like you know like there are a lot we have a we just launched right so it's very very new and we have uh, five or six hundred people who've started and are in now in the in the odyssey they're on their adventure and we're having some incredible feedback from them um just like the synchronicities and things that are happening but one of the things that is coming through strong from everyone is that the dream arc is helping them particularly with dealing with some of the underworld creatures which what we call mm -hmm you know, the shadow layer, you know, the, the, where the, we call them the fear keys mm. and like things like spiders and snakes and biting insects. And uh, yeah, the kind of insect, the kind of things we, we feel revolted by might be a cockroach, might be a tick, might be something that we're like really flies even, you know, and what, it, what the dream arts doing is it's helping us see that every single one of those creatures contains a little transmission of divinity and actually, if we change our perception of them, if we open our heart and our mind to them, they behave differently around us. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's extraordinary. You know, and animals are so, they because they live in that quantum realm, animals, insects, fish, or you know, everything, they, they are so sensitive to our thoughts, feelings, presence, particularly if we have fear around them. And so what, you're, what we're finding is that a lot of people are overcoming fears or revulsions mm -hmm. to creatures that, they, that have always been part of their life that they don't really like or, or they, that annoy them. And actually seeing some wonder in, in the fact that everything, even the biting insects, have, a, have an absolutely important place in the food chain somewhere. And so if you took that out, you know, a whole thing would just collapse. You know, the cute, cuddly ones wouldn't be there. So it's all part of this ecosystem that's alive around us and within us and that includes our families our relationships our businesses you know everything that we're involved in is part of that ecosystem and that's obviously the big drumbeat of 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 the of of today is like how can we take care of the planet better mm. and it really does begin with you know in in many ways with listening and to the animals and the, especially the ones that we're afraid of you know things like sharks you know that we have these that we've been trained to fear because of our media and yet if you you know some of our indigenous elders that you know you'll if you when you come into the course you'll 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 hear them t talking and um they will talk about these creatures and in a completely different way like in there's a tradition of shark shamans for example you know um of these people that make friends with sharks and and that and you get to realize that actually even creatures that seem kind of impassive like that they also really have a, a resonance you know in some way if you know how to be with them if you know how to respect them and respect their area they they they're not they're not interested in harming you you know they're really not so and anyway there's 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 a huge there's so much it can really change the way we are in our everyday life. And that, I guess that includes like people that annoy us as well. <laughs> you know, yeah. um, I was um, fascinated when you said about seeing the people in our families as animals, because immediately my mind goes to a certain place with a certain person. Mm -hmm. And then I'm aware that it's doing that. And I'm switching my perception around because I don't want to associate them with that animal, you know, and I understand what I'm doing to them, actually, you know, by, by imprinting them in certain ways. The, I mean, what you're saying makes so much sense. I mean, when you think about babies and toddlers, 
you never see them screaming yeah at anything you know they're mm -hmm. fascinated by insects um it's only later on as we learn to associate an insect with something that we then become afraid of it or you know mm -hmm. don't want it in our uh, field at all mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, you talk about animals, every single animal being represented in our DNA. What do you mean by that? Um, well, I, when I say that, I mean that, you know, we have been on an evolutionary ladder through all those creatures, you know. And so, you know, that, all of that lives inside us as genetic memory, you know, in some way. And, and we still don't really understand our non-coding DNA, which is most of the DNA in our body. And there's a very good chance that it's that DNA that contains the, the memory signatures of all we've ever been. Um, and so there's a resonance in us with every single creature in the universe. You know, every single rock, every single plant is, has traveled through us, has been part of us. You know, and we've and, and so we're kind of we're this holographic representation of the whole. And that's why, in a way, we use the animals as symbols or icons of aspects of our psyche that we need to cultivate relationships with in different ways. You know, and so like, I know that you're, you've got an affinity with a hippo, haven't you? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think, you know, we thought we might be fun because, like, in the codex the codex is the book of all the, all the creatures that i've written that rosie's done all the artwork um i think you know would do you want to hit shall we shall we like listen to a bit of the hippo just because i, yeah, I am, so, yeah tell me i don't about know what it, i can't remember what it's about but rosie <laughs> share it with us i would love to do that um and i i, I want to just add that the you know, you might associate someone with an animal that maybe you had negative associations with, and then you might have a little guilt response about that. Um, then if you go to the codex, you will get new associations with that animal. They're all beautiful and positive associations, and that might actually change your experience of this person. So I just wanted to add that. Um, and also, Richard's talking about how the dream arc actually can change our relationships to the actual animals and the environment and make us want to care for the planet. And that because each one has a new association. So like, for example, let's say um, Richard's working with the crocodile and, and the association is a fear of chaos. That whenever he connects with the crocodile, he starts to investigate his own relationship to chaos, where chaos, chaos may be happening in, happening in his life and how he can, get present in relation to it, open his heart in relationship to it, right? So it could be the fear of chaos, the fear of emptiness, the fear of the unknown. And these little associations can suddenly open up a whole new world to us. So I wanna say I'm about to read the guidance from the hippo. And here's the image of the hippo. <laughs> um, and just as people are listening, I invite you to think, yes, this hippo is an important animal to Sandy. But there's a reason why we're all listening to this talk right now. And the hippo has a message for all of us. So let's just really, Sandy is the, she's the path through which we are receiving the wisdom of the hippo. Okay. I am hippo. As a potent changer, I come into the lives only of those in the throes of deep change. Deep inside your physical body, processes are underway that may cause you anxiety or uncertainty. When the outer world changes, it is because a fundamental structure is being uprooted on the inside first. My advice to you is not to put too intense a focus on the outside events that are occurring, but to bring your awareness within to the, pace, to the place where the change is truly occurring. For this, you may need deep breathing. When the foundation of the earth on which you have stood for so long quakes, it is a time to, twist, to test your level of trust. Should I do one more? One sure, more? One more. Okay. Yeah. Just, it, it is so related to the things that you've been saying in this conversation, Sandy. Inside job. Okay. I come to tell you trust in this change. Trust in the universe, trust in this timing, trust in your uncertainty, which is absolutely normal, human, and honest. You do not need to pretend everything is okay or to desperately cling to the old forms. 
I bring the gift of realism, trust, and drop more deeply into the cellular process. Deep change of this kind has its own timing and phases. By the time it is done with your life, you may not even recognize yourself. Settle in for the long term. Let go of short-term goals and concerns, but attend to the daily details that need attending to. Avoid making long-term decisions. Be with those you love and take care of your own body with great gentleness. And it, and it, goes, it goes on, but I know our time is running out. Yes, so yeah, big yeah. invitation to people to explore. Mm. It, very, very interesting. Um, we don't have a lot of time. We've got about seven minutes. I do want to talk about the, um, you're doing a free 90 minute interactive um, webinar, aren't you? So that people can get to experience some of the things that they would experience um, on the, um, you know, when they're doing the dream arc process. But there's one thing I want to touch on before then. You say that a new kind of human being is coming into the world. This new human will emerge as the dragonfly emerges from within the structure of the old human. We call this being Homo Sanctus, the sacred human. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, well, you know, the, the dragonfly is a wonderful emblem or, or icon of this change, you know, this that, that's going on. And it, it's, the, it's such a great story, the story of the dragonfly. I've <laughs> got time to do it. But um, people will probably know that, you know, um, the dragonfly has this old life where it's, it lives underwater and then it comes out of the water. So it lives for two or three years underwater as a predator. And then it comes out of the water and it comes up into the light and then it goes through this mutation where it, it, the old part of its body falls away and this beautiful glittering dragon emerges and takes to the air. It's complete, you know, but when it's in that underwater environment, it has no idea that that creature lies inside it. It's, it and, and that creature of the future has no relationship to the creature of the past, none whatsoever. And that's what Homo Sanctus is. That's what our new human is. It has no relationship to the current human. So we can't even, we can barely imagine it. The dream arc is a kind of, it's a way that invites us to begin to imagine what it might be like to live through this right brain way in a completely different way to reinvent everything. And, you know, everything around us through that brain of the, you know, it's like, it's like the, 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 the brain or the heart of a child, you know, and that doesn't mean that things are immature. It just means they're seen for what they are rather than kind of what them, what the mind then imposes on it. So in a way, that's what I mean by homo sanctus. <laughs> yeah. And, well, and the, you yeah. know, you're, you're pointing to exactly what is happening to us all now. I mean, everybody is changing, you know, partly as a result of the pandemic, um, you know, and many other changes that are happening in the world. They're all changing us, even if we're not, you know, engaged in some of those things. And we are beginning to discover new aspects of ourselves. People who don't want to go back to work because they've found I love going out in nature. I want to work from home. I want to be free to be able to, you know, nurture myself through the day. Or So really what you said about the dragonfly, I think this is something that is happening to us. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that with the dream arc, we can completely dive into that process, you know, and accelerate it. Absolutely. So do, do come and join us on where it's on the 28th of this of June. Um, and we're going to showcase the dream arc and answer questions live and talk about it and, and show you show you the, the under the hood of the course. We're going to share the screen and show you what it's how it works and some of the features and things, um, because it is a big thing to kind of comprehend. And um, and so it, it'll help you to sort of begin to get a hold of oh okay this i'm beginning to understand yeah. i'm going to be i'm going to become part of a movement <laughs> i'm going to become part of a whole new way of looking at my life um that's going to change my life um and and it's going to take some time it's not just a thing you do it's uh, it, it it'll trickle along in the background of your life probably for at least a year if not longer but it doesn't mean you'll be spending all your time online and all that it just means that that's just the way in which you you kind of initiate the next part of your journey. Um, so, yeah, come join us at genekeys.com forward slash events. Um, 
so gene keys g-e-n-e-k-e-y-s dot com forward slash events um and or come to the gene keys uh youtube channel and you'll find us you'll find the event on there but please do come join us um and we're going to have some fun as well we're going to do some some fun things at the same time come well the dream tank (laughs) dream tank yeah yeah um very quickly before we close Mm. if you had to sum up this entire experience of the dream arc and what it can do in just a couple of words what would you say how would you describe it i I would say it just sprinkles fairy dust all over your life (laughs) just like that (laughs) rosie I would say it gives you a visceral experience of belonging. Ah, that's lovely. Well, thank you both very much for joining us. I'm sure, sorry we didn't have more time to go deeper, but, you know, people can join you on the 28th. I hope they do. Um, as you say, the Dream Arc holds all the keys to our story, which belongs to us alone, and we're the only ones who can tell our story through living it utterly holding nothing back. I really like that because I think that is so important that we are here. We need to know who we are and experience everything that we've got. Richard Rudd, Rosie Aronson, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, thank so you. So um, you can go to wisdomkeepers.net and learn more about Rosie and you can go to genekeys.com and learn everything that you need to know about Gene Keys and DreamArc and everything else that Richard Rudd has done. That brings us to the end of this week's show. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer and I'll be back at the same time next week with another edition of What Is Going On. Till then, it's goodbye from me. <laughs>